Welcome everyone. It's noon and so it's time for our weekly webinar from One Schoolhouse on what's new or what's notable. And I'm Sarah Hanewald. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse and I am joined by Peter Gao on our typical Wednesday. So Peter, you want to introduce yourself quickly and then I'm going to introduce Liz and turn it over. Sure. I'm Peter Gao. I'm the uh, Independent Curriculum Resource Director at One Schoolhouse and uh, been around the education world for a really long time. Liz? Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Cates. I am the Director of, oh, I served as the Director of School and Student Support at One Schoolhouse, and I am now the Assistant Head of School for School Engagement. Um, I have to get my mind to catch up to my business cards. But I've been here on the One Schoolhouse team for three years, and I've worked in independent schools for close to 20 years as a classroom teacher, Dean of Students, and Director of Enrollment Management. Uh, I'm an independent school graduate, and I am an independent school parent with two rising fifth graders. Um, so I am hip deep in the wonderful world of online and distance learning. Um, I guess fantastic, but <laughs> in these days. But so I want to thank Liz. She's got some slides that she's going to start to share. But Liz has deep experience in student support and has been really thinking about this year and how are we going to set up systems that are going to help us support students. So Liz, if you want to share your screen. Sure. And we will. Here we go. Get going. Here? And yeah, we are. I think that captures it. OK, great. So hi, everybody. I'm going to spend some time talking today about understanding and supporting our faculty in anxious times. Um, and my guess is that you are hearing this message from at least one person on your faculty and maybe everybody. Um, or you're seeing it in the newspapers or online. Um, and so I want to spend some time this morning unpacking this response. Um, so we're going to take a look at the research about what's going on around um, workers and students um, living in coronavirus with, um, and mental health. And then we're going to talk about how we shift our thinking um, to get ready to do the support we need to do in a hybrid learning environment. So I want to start out by asking you to think back to March and how we talked about closing them. So re remember when we were all worried about seniors missing prom? And that was really big and everybody was worried about that and we were worried about graduation. We were focused on stepping away and we were focused on events and traditions on the moments of what it means to be an independent school. And those moments are key. They're part of what gives our school identity and they build our culture. Um, but they're also just moments. And now four months in, our thinking has shifted. Um, and we're not worried about moments like prom anymore. We're worried about this long-term existential high stakes problems um, and they're problems that feel intractable and overwhelming um, i'll tell you when i look at this list i don't feel ready to, to hand to tackle all of these at once even if i were doing what i knew how to do in a classroom um, but our schools are going to start in september where? We don't know. Online, on campus, if we're lucky, with all our kids, if we're luckiest, or with some of them, if we're right in the middle. Um, but we're going to have to deal with these issues. And, and that's overwhelming. Um, it's overwhelming to all of us. Yeah, it is hard to imagine that it is July. Sorry, I'm going to check. 21st, 22nd. And we're all saying, not really sure what's going to happen to start school. Right. So I'm going to hop in and share some research with you. Um, when I looked at this, I wrote this headline and then I started laughing and I thought, I didn't need to read research to tell you this. No kidding, COVID-19 <laughs> is increasing our stress. Um, but the magnitude of that is, I think, really worth a moment of looking at. 88% of workers are experiencing moderate to extreme stress over the course of the pandemic. 
Um, and that's everybody. That's our essential workers who are in the workplace. That's people who are working from home. Um, you might expect that people who are on the front lines and exposed are feeling more stress, but that's not true. Actually, people working from home are actually experiencing a little more stress than the average um, because they're managing a new way to work and they're often managing work in a new environment with uh, new coworkers who often are under the age of 18. So we know that. Um, that bottom left statistic though, that 69% of workers claim this is the most stressful time of their entire professional career. When you think about the stresses that our careers go under um, on a regular basis, to have the majority of people respond, the vast majority of people responding to this survey in this moment tells you something about how, how pulled people are and how stressed out they feel. And then when you think 43% of people have gotten physically ill, not they haven't gotten COVID-19, they've been physically ill as a result of work-related stress, you start to understand how big this is for everybody. So the statistics here from the Mental Health Alliance, they have an online screening tool, one for anxiety and one for depression. That blue bar at the bottom, that's their baseline. That's 100% what an average month looks like. In May 2020, people seeking out screenings for anxiety increased 370%. Wow. And people seeking out screenings for depression increased to 394%. People feel like they have a problem right now. It's real. So that's what's true for grownups. But let's dial in a little bit about what adolescents are, are feeling, our middle and our high school students. So 70%, this is a survey um, that was um, sponsored by 4-H um, also in May 2020. So these are really recent numbers. Um, so 70% of the respondents said that they had experienced struggles with mental health since the onset of COVID-19. 55% of them said they'd experienced anxiety, and 45% of them said they'd had excessive stress. 43% said they'd been depressed. We know that mental health is the largest chronic health illness in our population, but these are extraordinary numbers. This represents a tremendous gain. And school is a challenge to those issues and also in some places a solution. So of those students, 71% of them said schoolwork was making them feel anxious and depressed. The way they are doing school was contributing to their mental health issues. But they also still see school as a place where they can get help. And almost 80% of them want a safe space at school to discuss mental health. They identify school as a place where they can get help and support and where change is possible. And I think that's the number that we want to keep in mind as the beacon, is that students see us as a place where we can help and a place where we can change the dialogue about mental health and talking honestly about what's hard and what our challenges are and how we can get help. I really like the way you call that a beacon. I, th I think that's a sign for us. There's something we can do here. Yeah. So those challenges that those students respond, uh, identify in May 2020, those aren't going to go away when we have a vaccine or when we're back on campus because social isolation and loneliness have long-term effects on mental health and wellness. For one thing, children and adolescents are probably more likely to experience high rates of depression and anxiety during isolation. Uh, this, this data here comes from a uh, research survey. It's, the researchers took 80 survey, 80 scientific papers that covered issues like isolation, depression, loneliness, trauma, and pulled all that research together and said, what can we learn? Even though we don't have this moment, we have other similar moments. And what can we learn from that? So we know that children and adolescents 
are especially vulnerable right now because of the interaction between social emotional development and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, we know that loneliness has long-term effects, that young people who experience significant social isolation are three times more likely to develop depression in the future. So while we have an acute problem now, we're going to continue to be dealing with it. And loneliness can impact mental health for up to nine years. I'll tell you, as a parent, I look at that number and my heart just goes into my throat for my kids and for all the kids I've ever taught. Because what that means is that we're looking at our third graders and thinking this is still gonna make a difference to them when they graduate from high school. Mental health is intrinsically tied to student performance and to student learning. That's because depression impairs our ability to think. It doesn't just mean that we're tired or we're sad and so we're scattered. It actually literally affects things like executive functioning, short-term memory, processing speed, and attention. And anxiety hits that with a double sucker punch, does all those things. Plus, it focuses your attention on mistakes and reduces your control to correct them. So, so kids who are dealing with depression, or pardon me, with anxiety, also see where they're making mistakes, where, they, where they're not meeting their own expectations and they can't change them. And those, both of those things just become a cycle. Sadness and hopelessness relate to drops in test scores, but here's that other moment. When students have caring relationships at school, that correlates to increase in test scores. So when we as a community can hold our students, they're going to do better. We can't solve this, but we can mitigate this. And this is where independent schools have tremendous strength. We are small communities where students are known. And harnessing that is going to be one of the key secrets for moving forward. So before March 2020, schools did a lot of talking about wellness and mental health and student and, and stu social emotional learning. But schools were really about academic growth. That was the focus. Um, and we knew that mental health was important and, and it impacted that. But if you'll permit me a moment to go to a pre-COVID world in this photograph that makes me smile every time I look at it, before March, learning, that was that motorcycle. It was going down the road and mental health was the sidecar. It was good to have, you know, it was there, but also it wasn't in control. What was in control was learning and learning content and learning skills. This is different now. Now mental health isn't the sidecar. It is the road we are driving on. If we aren't taking care of the mental health of our students and our teachers, that motorcycle, the education piece of what we do, it's gonna fall over. So we need to attend to mental health in order for our schools to be able to do the work they usually do. Okay, and are you saying that this is gonna be true whether a school's able to open or whether they're going hybrid or whether they're online, that the impact of the students from what they've experienced so far, we're gonna be dealing with that no matter what. Absolutely. So we can't just solve the problem once we're opened. Right. And we're going to be dealing with it for a long time. So let's, let's talk about what we do. If that's the landscape, what do we do next? So teachers are masters of multitasking. Also, I just want to pause that finding a picture of a teacher in a classroom where it actually looks like they're doing work is very hard. They all look like they're like models, you know, in a perfectly thing. And the kids are all like, I don't know about you. That's not what my classes ever looked like. Um, they were messy and they were busy. Um, and so I like this because it captures a little bit of that. The classroom doesn't look perfect. It never does. So teachers are masters of multitasking. What that means is that this teacher here, he is doing a lot right now. He is passing out work. He is thinking about his lesson plan. He's surveying his students and sort of checking in on them mentally. 
who's engaged, who's not. For that kid who's not engaged over at the back, what am I going to do next? At the same time that I'm working with this teacher, student who is engaged over here. Oh, and by the way, do I remember the code to hook up to the projector? Teachers do all of this without even realizing that they are doing it. It is a system that they don't realize is a system. And they're gathering data that they don't realize is data. And they're gathering most of that information about their students. But in order to do that, those data things, they all rely on being in that same space. And that's because on campus, a lot of our systems for student wellness are proximal. They rely on being together. They're implicit. They're not about mental health. They're about lots of other things. And they're informal, meaning that they're not regularized or systematized. In the hybrid environment, it's different because you need explicit systems and you need explicit conversations. So let me compare what those two things look like. Here we are at school. Wouldn't it be great? Um, so in a proximal system, the teacher's in class. He's looking at his students. He's saying, what, what's going on here? What do I need? He's assessing this. He's checking in with them. Um, and he's checking in with them overtly and covertly. So he's, you know, maybe checking in with the student. Hey, how are you doing today? How was the game last night? But he's also watching. And, you know, we've all had the student who says, I'm fine. And you look at them and you know, they are not fine. But if you weren't looking at them, you might not know it. And they're informal. So let's say that that teacher, let's say he's worried about one of those students. He's walking down the hallway and he sees that student's advisor. He says, oh, hey, I just had Susie in class. How is she doing? So again, it relies on seeing each other to trigger them and it's informal. So there's no way to make sure that it gets happened and there's no way to track it. And then it's often implicit. So as schools, we often do a much better job, and this is true especially in day schools, we often do a much better job of tracking students' academic distress than we do their social and emotional distress. So a lot of times you might have an academic risk team meeting that surfaces issues of mental health, but that's not what they're there for. Again, it's the sidecar. It's not the thing that's driving. So if you we say that we, yes, I'm sorry. I just want to say, do you, do you think that we even know what our systems are? Ooh. What you just described seems like something that teachers are doing um, instinctively or intuitively. Yep. That's true. A lot of the time with some, and, and it's different school to school. Some schools really do have strong systems, but for most of us, what we rely on, is how good teachers are at their jobs because they are really good at it. Um, and we rely on being in the same place and the reassurance of that kind of a, of a touch, of that kind of a check-in. Um, and so, you know, I think back to when I was a classroom teacher and if I had a student that I was worried about, you know, I'd look for where they were in the lunchroom. I'd gather that data. Um, you know, I didn't know that I was doing that. I wasn't, you know, I might say to a colleague, hey, how's she doing in math? But I wasn't tracking that. And I didn't have a way to know what was going on unless I asked. And only sometimes when you ask, you start to put together the pattern. So things like grade team meetings become really important. Exactly. So we know that most of us are going to be in hybrid or or fully online learning environments uh, in September. So what that can look, so let's talk a little bit about what the systems need to look like in that environment. First of all, they need to be online because even if you're on campus, you can use the online system, but you can't use the campus system if you're working from home. So you're going to want something that teachers fill out digitally and you're going to want it to be consistent. You're gonna to wanna to have a regular schedule for doing it. That's two re there's two reasons for this. One is because we're all training ourselves in these new systems. 
When they're consistent, we learn the pattern and we learn the habit and we stick with habits as we build them. The other reason is, and I'll tell you this from my work at One Schoolhouse, is that students go downhill a lot faster in an online environment than they do on campus. So you need to be checking in regularly and systemically in order to make sure that you're getting everybody. Because, you know, maybe you have an academic risk meeting once every two weeks or three weeks. That's too long online. It's too long to go for check-ins or to ring an alarm bell. And when we're talking about mental health, it needs to be explicit. We need to be asking about mental health. We need to be asking about students who aren't doing their work, not as an academic penalty, but as an indicator of, um, of students pulling back in isolation. We need to ask about students who aren't communicating with us, again, because that's a marker of isolation. And so identifying what those red flags are in your community and specifically for mental health and specifically asking about them are going to be essential. So we know in, in September, nothing is going to feel normal or easy um, or steady. We're gonna have to build trust. We're gonna build trust with each other as adults. We're gonna build trust with our students. We're going to build trust with our parents. And trust happens when there is consistency and transparency. When you do the same thing over and over again, and you tell people what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and then you do it. And that's essential. We need to have patterns and systems because that's what makes people feel rooted. And right now, nobody has those. So that's a place where we as students can give a gift to our students and to our teachers. And by creating the systems that support students, our faculty, you go back to that list of intractable problems at the beginning, suddenly those start to get manageable. They start to get less overwhelming, not because the problems are smaller, but because we have a way to respond to them. So, I'm gonna be talking about these issues with Dr. Lisa Damore in a course that's coming up in August. And I hope that if these ideas have felt meaningful and powerful to you, that you'll think about that course too. Um, it's designed for middle and upper school administrators. So I talked here a little bit about what's shaping the landscape. This course is really about um, building an action plan. So uh, Dr. Damore and I will take you through the steps that you need to have for student mental health and communicating effectively and supporting faculty and parents. So I'm going to stop sharing here so that I, we can take some questions and talk a little bit about this. I know we have just five minutes left. That's okay. We have a couple of questions that came in already. And one is something that I just want to um, emphasize. You talked about developing online systems. And that applies to whether we're in hybrid or whether we're all together because if we have those online systems, we'll be able to use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, exactly. That's change. So one of the questions that came in is about cohorting. And this person says, we're going to have people who aren't normally solely responsible for a group of students doing that in the coming year. And is that there a recommendation on how to help people who are new to this? We talked about teachers being experts. What about when this is kind of new to someone? Mm -hmm. So this goes back to, to being explicit. So talking about the markers that you want people to look for. So in, when we do this at one schoolhouse, the markers for us are falling grades. They're, um, they're, a, they're missing assignments. Um, and then one that may not be, it's not responding to teachers' emails. It's not communicating. Um, those for us, for our program, are the red flags for wellness um, because they indicate a drop in performance that's not usual. They indicate a student that's avoiding work, so that probably means anxiety or, or decreased cognitive functioning, which could be mental health. And 
it's avoidance. It's feeling like the personal contact is overwhelming because the student doesn't feel in control. So you want to identify what those markers are for your community and make sure that everybody, so those people who are in the cohorts, that they're looking for behaviors. Those are the data points. Okay, so I like that. So student behaviors are the data points for not necessarily knowing exactly what to do as the adult in the cohort, but for knowing when you need help. Exactly. Great. Yeah. So one of the things um, that people wonder is, are there systems that are already defined? Is every school going to have to invent this from the start? Or are there systems that you can recommend that people can adapt for their own community? So the pre-made systems, honestly, are usually really expensive and they require really a widespread and deep use of a learning management system. They're built for things like online universities. Um, there are some for K-12s, but, um, but they take a while to learn. And so I would tell you that I think you're better off, we, honestly, what we use at One Schoolhouse is we use Google Forms. We send out the link every week to teachers and we say, you need to fill this out. And if you don't have any kids that you're worried about, you need to write, I'm not worried about anybody. Um, so that we make sure we catch everybody. So there, the ready-made systems, quite frankly, um, are expensive and take a fair amount of training to implement. Um, but there are really low, uh, there, are, there are free and easy ways to build systems for your school. Great. And then this question is specifically about the course. Will the course propose systems that a school can, it looks like maybe where to go or is it an evaluation of the systems that you already have in place? Yeah. So um, what we'll be doing is we'll be talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention um, is the first thing. So the, what you want in primary is what you do for everybody. Secondary is your kids with warning signs and tertiary is the kids you're really worried about. Um, and so we will talk for each of them about the kind of interventions that, that, that are helpful. And then in, folks in the course will actually build an action plan for their school. So you're going to take a look at what we've suggested, think about your school community, think about what else is applicable there, and build the action plan from that. We got a question in the chat, but also if you have a question that you'd like us to answer, please put it in the Q&A. We've got a couple more minutes. But um, this one is asking if there's anything similar for lower school administrators. And I was wondering if you could also think about, you know, what would the lower school administrator get out of this course, given that it's designed for middle and upper? Yeah. So. Part of the reason it was hard decision to do it just for, for middle and upper school students. And I would say that we would consider middle school in that we would say that if you're working with students in fifth grade and up, that we would call this course applicable. So um, the general ideas of the course absolutely are applicable. That idea of primary, secondary, tertiary, the idea that you're going to want to talk about ways to teach to um, you want to teach for calm and teach for connection. Um, that's also true in the lower school, although the strategies that you're going to use will be different. Um, and the way that you want to loop parents in. All of those things are going to be essential for building a system. And so you may find it useful for your particular lower school. What we won't be doing, though, is talking about the intersection of development in the lower school with mental health in a way that that we're going to do part of that is that you know with fifth graders like like when i think about the five-year journey that they've been on oh my gosh i would as a parent i've been using different tools it feels like every six months since they were born um and so that specific piece is not we're not going to give guidance on that in this course but building an action plan that is something that you may be able to use. You'll want to think about your particular school and your school culture. Fantastic. I, think it, I assume you're also going to be really focusing on the, those principles of consistency and explicitness yes. uh, in, the, in whatever you are trying to do to support your students and, your, and their families and your faculty. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, it is time for us to end, so we'll say goodbye, but um, 
we're going to follow up on this some more, I think, into the future as well as this evolves. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Liz.